What is up, everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. These are my full card breakdown and predictions for UFC Vegas 79. We got Rafael Fiziev going against Mateus Gamron. And we are back for another full card breakdown and prediction video. This week we are breaking down a card that is back in the Apex. It's been a while since we've been in the Apex. And we are ending off a 17-week stretch of UFC cards with, uh, yeah, you know, an Apex card here. 11 fights, you know, not the best card in the world, but really looking forward to this main event. Really looking forward to the card as a whole. Uh, before we get into it all, if you guys can please do me a favor, leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you have not already. That is always much, much appreciated. I do have a couple shout-outs I need to give. The first one being a shout-out to my guy, Morphatrix. This is a guy who, um, you know, posts a lot of comments on my Dana White's Contender Series breakdowns, you know, giving some extra insight. So there was no significant strike contest last week, but there were still a couple people that did comment the significant strikes anyway, including uh, Morphatrix, and he commented 164 significant strikes, and he got it right on the dot. So it's a shame that there was no contest. It was not a pay-per-view, but um, just got to shout him out. That was an incredible guest there by him. And I, like I said, I do appreciate the comments that he brings into the, the Dana White's Contender Series. Shout out to him. Uh, I also want to shout out Lupi Godinez. Shout out to Lupi going out there, using all her abilities, and went out there and just completely destroyed Elise Reed, cashing the inside the distance prop and cashing the submission prop. Shout out to Loopy. Me and Loopy are, are back on good terms after the Angela Hill situation. And then last but not least, shout out to Daniel Zellhuber for going out there and getting the second round submission. I think my second favorite call of the year, right behind Nate Landwehr, second round submission, but was able to cash the inside the distance for Zellhuber, cash the round two, and cash the round two submission it was the second best card of the year for me last week in uh, noche ufc uh, plus 9.28 units tracked um, hit the the prelim parlay the main card parlay the hail mary parlay went seven one and three on the best bets just a really really good card for me overall and having a really good year up 60 units this year with a 19 percent roi we are three quarters in and uh, looking to end the year strong for sure. And lastly, I do want to say thank you to to you guys out there that watch weekly and support me as well. You know, on the website, the Patreon, all that. It does it does go a long, long way. And 98% of you are the reason I show up week after week. A 17 week stretch is not easy. I put a ton of time, effort, and work into all of this. Um, Two percent of you, on the other hand, absolutely suck. I mean, two percent of you people just suck so bad. And, uh, but you know, I'm not doing it for the 2%. I'm doing it for the 98% of people that comment, that like, that are, that are not complete, you know, jerks in the comment section. Um, last week, somebody said he was going to do the opposite of all my plays last week. And my goodness, I, I hope he did. Cause if he did, he had a horrible night. So it's been a great year thus far. Um, ending a 17 week stretch here and um, looking to finish the year strong. We have some great fights coming up after this break. We have uh, Alex Pereira, Jiri Perhoshka that just got announced. We got the flyweight co main event for 296, um, Pantoja and Brandon Roy Val. We have uh, Colby Covington making his return going against Leon Edwards for 296. We have some really good cards coming up. So definitely looking forward to it. Um, do you want to shout out prize picks? Um, Use promo code DFSBTN for a 100% deposit bonus up to $100. I'll be getting out my prize picks video really late this week, a lot of, you know, really behind this week, but um, that'll be out shortly. And then also, if you do want to support me more, if you do want extra content, be sure to check out DFSbythenumbers.com. But with all that out of the way, I say we get into the card and we're going to kick it off with some low level fights. I know people get offended when I say that, but I mean, it's, it's a low-level fight. Uh, Tamara's Vidal going against Montserrat Rendon. And we will start with Tamara's Vidal, who is 25 years old, 5'6", with a 68-inch reach, 7-1, and 5-0 and and in her last five fights. Montserrat Rendon, she is 34 years old, 5'8", with a 68-inch reach, 5-0, and 5-0 and and in her only five fights. So... We'll take a look at the odds here like we always do, and we see that uh, Tamara's Vidal opened up a minus 275 favorite. She's currently sitting at minus 220, and then we have Rendon, who opened up as a plus 235 favorite, and she's currently sitting at plus 185. So I'm not 
entirely sure what's what's really going on here you know why Rendon is in the UFC and not saying she's completely off or or nothing like that but you know Rendon is somebody that is is 34 years old at this point she's somebody that just hasn't fought anybody so this signing really makes no sense to me whatsoever and I'll be honest I wasn't extremely high on Tamara's Vidal when she first got into the UFC and I'm still really not but you know she has shown that she's made improvements you know she's only 25 years old she looks to be you know getting much better and better each and every time we see her in the cage she's a brown belt in bjj she has some grappling and she clearly has power on the feet you know knocking out ramona pasquale um in her last fight which pasquale she's not the best but what she is is she's very very tough and so for videl to go out there and finish her the way she did um it was impressive so i feel like videl is going to be you know dangerous wherever this fight goes on the mat she has that brown belt and then on the feet she has the power um so i think she can get a knockout a sub and i think if this does go the distance she's going to be the one landing the much harder shots here across 15 so i think there's a lot of reasons to like videl as far as a pick you know am i bending her at minus two 20 absolutely not but I'll take Vidal to win this fight and I'll say she gets it done by second round submission moving on we got Mizuki Inoue going against Hannah Goldie we got Inoue who is 29 years old five foot three with a 64 inch reach um, 14 and six and three and two in her last five fights Hannah Goldie 31 years old five foot four with a 61 inch reach six and three and two and three in her last five fights we'll take a look at the odds here Mizuki Inoue a really big favorite open at minus 350 currently minus 315 Hannah Goldie open up plus 285 currently plus 265 so this is Mizuki in a way who we have not seen fight in a like a concerning amount of time the last time Mizuki in a way fought was three years ago which is crazy because it seems like it was just yesterday when she went out there and fought Amanda Lamush but that was that was three years ago the last time she got a win was four years ago in a very close fight against Yanan Wu that really could have went either way I actually thought Yanan Wu won the fight so um, it's been a very long time since we've seen Mizuki Inoue in there. I think she's been battling some injuries, and now she's minus 315, which is which is ridiculous, but there's no way I can pick Hannah Goldie in this matchup. Inoue should be the better fighter everywhere it goes. On the feet, Inoue has solid striking, really good volume that I like. On the match, she does have a grappling path, I'd say, but what did concern me was... You know, in a way, she hasn't really had much success with the grappling as of late, you know, against these higher level fighters. Uh, the majority of her submissions do come against like really, really low level opponents. And the last submission win in a way has gotten was back in 2016. So um, I think this fight does go to decision. And I think it could be like more competitive than this line does indicate. Like, I, I don't think Hannah Goldie's that great, but um, I also don't think in a way's that that great either. So um, weird fight, but I'm going to take Inoue, which is terrifying considering she's been off for so long, but there's no way I'm ever picking Hannah Goldie in a fight ever. So give me Mizuki Inoue to win this fight. I'll say she wins it by decision. Let's move on. Um, next we have Muhammad Usman going against Jake Collier. Come on. <laughs> uh, we got Muhammad Usman. He was 34 years old, six foot two with a 79 inch reach, nine and two with, uh, you know, four and one in his last five fights. Jake Collier, 34 years old, six foot three, with a 78 and a half inch reach, 13 and nine, and one and four in his last five fights. Let's take a look at the odds. We see that Muhammad Usman opened up plus 165, currently minus 140. Jay Collier opened up minus 190, currently plus 120. And this fight is, uh, it's a mess. Um, this fight is an absolute mess. This fight is um, a tricky fight. So. I remember, it wasn't too long ago, I remember when Muhammad Usman took on Junior Toffa, and Junior Toffa was like everybody's favorite play that week, you know, Junior Toffa was going to knock out Usman, all that, and I was one of the, the few people that, you know, picked Muhammad Usman, I didn't bet him because I didn't really didn't want to bet on that fight, um, but I picked Muhammad Usman, I actually picked him to win by decision as well, which was, um, you know, pretty, pretty juicy odds, I didn't bet it, like I said, and I'm probably not betting this fight, but... Um, yeah, and, and the reason I picked Muhammad Usman against Junior Tafa was was this reason. Junior Tafa is a boxer with really no MMA experience. He has a couple fights. Um, he hasn't been fighting MMA for long, and he doesn't have a wrestling background, Junior Tafa. He doesn't have a grappling background, whereas Jake Collier, Jake Collier has fought, you know, 
good guys. Jake Collier has been around for a while at this point. Jake Collier does have a wrestling background. He does have a grappling background. So, um, and now people are running to the window to, to bet Muhammad Usman and I guess he could win this fight. Um, I really don't know what's going to happen here. This fight is, is it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous fight where, you know, Jake Collier is going to be the better striker by a mile. It's not even close. Muhammad Usman striking is rough. Uh, first of all, Muhammad Usman's landing less than one significant strike per minute, and his accuracy is horrendous at only 27%. So he's not throwing anything, Muhammad Usman. And when he is throwing, he is missing. But... He has power. He's going to have the power advantage. If he does land on Jake Collier, maybe he can knock Collier out. I think both guys have pretty poor cardio, but you have to favor Muhammad Usman in the cardio department. Um, I guess the one concern for me, uh, and I have a lot of concerns about this matchup, the one concern is what does Jake Collier look like on his back at the heavyweight division? What does he look like you know, grappling in the heavyweight division? Because we've seen it before. But we've seen it, you know, as a middleweight, um, not as a heavyweight. So uh, I do have concerns about what happens if Muhammad Usman does take down Jake Collier. I mean, could that be the fight? You know, is Jake able to compete on the mat at, at this point of his career at the heavyweight division? Uh, with all that said, you know, Jake Collier, I saw him on Twitter the other day, and he looks to be in the best shape he's been in in, in a while. Jake Collier looks like he, he, he dropped like 20 to 30 pounds. We'll have to see at weigh-ins. But he looks like he did drop a lot of weight for this camp, which, I mean, it, it's not going to hurt. Maybe it will hurt him just because Mohamed Usman's going to be the stronger guy, whatever. But, you know, I like to see the fact that Jake Collier is in better shape. I'm going to pick Collier here. You know, this fight is um, a greasy fight for sure. Um, but I'll take Jake Collier to potentially stuff the takedowns, keep it on the feet. And on the feet, Jake Collier looks like a, a big favorite. But, you know, I mentioned a lot of concerns on the Collier side. So give me Collier with uh, little to no confidence in this fight is uh, ridiculous, like I said. Moving on, we have Jacob Alcoon going against Cody Brundage. We got Jacob Alcoon, 28 years old, 5'9", with a 73-inch reach, 7-2, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. Cody Brundage, 29 years old, 6' foot with a 72-inch reach, 8-5, and 2-3 and and in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds. Jacob Alcoon is a massive favorite, biggest favorite on the card, open up minus 550, currently minus 700. Cody Brundage open up plus 420. He's currently plus 500. And yeah, this should be Malcoon. This should be Malcoon all day. Um he is going to have to weather a little bit of a storm here. You know, Cody Brundage, he does have some really good power early on. Um and then Malcoon also is going to have to fight off a, a guillotine or two or three or four or five in this matchup. But as long as he can do that, he should be able to win this fight, win it pretty dominantly. I don't really see where Cody Brundage poses many problems outside of that power. Uh, but, you know, Malcoon is a guy that's going to go out there. He's going to implement his will. And there's really nothing a lot of guys can do about that, including Cody Brundage, in my opinion. Um, you know, Ma Malcoon has phenomenal offensive wrestling, phenomenal cardio, phenomenal control. And Cody Brundage, offensively, his wrestling is really good. But defensively, you know, his wrestling leaves a lot to be desired. Um, on top, his ground game's not bad, but on bottom, it's it's not great at all. He looks like a fish out of water on the mat. He's you know losing a ton of minutes. He's losing moments. He's getting finished. We saw what Mikel Olozajchuk was able to do to him once Mikel was able to get on top. And then Cody Brundage will also just like like close his guard and like willingly do nothing and like willingly stall and lose minutes. And and Malkoon's going to to love that. I mean, Malkoon, it's going to make Malkoon's job easy, you know? If Cody Brunner just lays there and closes his guard and does nothing, I mean, that's what Malkoon wants. So, I feel like Malkoon wins this fight more often than not, like I said, has to avoid the power early, but outside of that, I, I don't like Brunage's chances in this one, hence the odds. I think Malkoon gets it done. It just comes down to, does Malkoon finish Brunage or not? Uh, Malkoon's not been a finisher at all. Malkoon is a black belt in BJJ, but Malkoon has zero submissions on his record, and I'm not entirely sure he finishes Cody Brundage here. Um, so, in terms of picking a method, I'll say Malkoon... Malkoon, I'll say he does sub him, but I'm not like completely sold on the method. But I do think it's a, a fight that Malkoon goes out there and wins um, pretty pretty dominantly, whether he does finish him or not. Moving on, we have a fun fight. Uh, to be honest, a weird fight, but this fight is going to be very violent. We got Andre Fialo going against Tim Means. We got Fialo, 29 years old, six foot with a 74 inch reach, 16 and seven, and two and three. 
In his last five fights, Tim Means, 39 years old, 6'2", with a 75-inch reach, 32-15-1, and one, and 2-3 two and three in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds, and we see that Andre Fialo opened up minus 145, currently minus 160. Uh, Tim Means opened up plus 125, currently plus 140. So I was kind of late uh, this week, obviously, in terms of doing a lot of my research. But, uh, you know, every time I went on Twitter, I saw people, you know, betting Tim Means. And I was like, oh, my gosh, how can anybody bet Tim Means? I mean, he's, he's 40 years old. His, his durability has gone. But after digging into the fight, I, I, I see why. Um, so both these guys have horrible durability at this point. And quite frankly, I think Fialo probably has the worst durability than Tim Means, which is saying a ton. Um, you know, Tim Means is a guy that at one point used to be super durable, super durable. Nowadays, he's getting he's getting wobbled, he's getting rocked, he's getting dropped, he's getting club and sub, he's getting he's getting finished in a lot of these fights. Um, you know, Tim Means has been through a ton of wars. He has 47, 48 fights. He's approaching 50 fights. He's approaching 40 years old. I think the durability is really starting to wane on the Tim Means side. And on the Fialo side, the durability sucks. I mean, this guy's been knocked out five times. He's been finished in back-to-back-to-back losses by knockout, and that's concerning. Um, you know, the advantages you got to give Fialo is is the power. This guy is not great at a lot of things. He has horrible cardio. He has horrible volume. He has no grappling. He has no nothing outside of that power, but that power has won him so many fights. Andre Fialo hits like a truck. And the thing that worries me about Means in this matchup is Means is going to go out there and fight like he always does. He's going to come forward. He's going to get into a war. He's going to eat one to give one. And that's not a great game to play against somebody that hits like a truck and Andre Fialo. Fialo has the power advantage here. And Fialo's 10 years younger as well. So I think somebody's getting served here. I think somebody's getting knocked out. I think Means can even knock out Fialo. Uh, but these guys are going to throw down, and I think it all comes down to who lands that big shot first. I'm going to say Fialo gets the first round knockout, but he's probably has to, he probably has to do it in the first round considering Fialo has about five minutes of cardio. So Fialo's fighting for his job here. He's on a three-fight skid, and uh, we'll see what happens. But you know, this is a matchup I don't think anybody should be confident on either side. Both these guys really lack durability, and both these guys are dangerous. So I think somebody's going down. I'm going to take Fialo to knock out Tim Means in the first round here. All right, moving on, we have Daniel Argetta going against Miles Johns. Probably, for me, the, the toughest and the, the, the closest fight for me on the card. Uh, we got Daniel Argetta, 30 years old, 5'7", with a 68-inch reach, 9-1, and one, and 3-1-1, one, one, and one, no contest in his last five fights. Miles Johns, 29 years old, 5'7", with a 66-inch reach, 13-2, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. So we have Dan Orgetta, who opened up a pick of minus 110, currently minus 170. Miles Johns opened up a pick of minus 110, currently plus 145. And I think a pick is probably more accurate here. I know Dan Orgetta, you know, is getting some hype nowadays. Um, and uh, I think people might be a little bit low on, on Miles Johns at this point. But, you know, stylistically, how this fight matches up, I think it's a close fight. Miles Johns, well, both guys have wrestling backgrounds. Miles Johns, really good wrestling. Um offensively he refuses to use it he's used it a lot outside the UFC like there was that fight where he took down Adrian Yanez several times but inside the UFC he doesn't go to the offensive wrestling at all I'm not really sure why but what he does do is he has really good defensive wrestling and in defense in general Miles Johns is around a 90% takedown defense and his striking defense is like 69% I mean Miles Johns defensively is incredible to be honest um offensively like I said he doesn't wrestle which I would like to see him in some matchup this this matchup I'm okay with him not wrestling and then on on the feet he is low volume but he is outlanding his opponents because defensively he is so good so and he has power as well so yeah I like a lot of uh the game of Miles Johns may not be the most exciting fighter but he's a really good fighter nonetheless he's fought some solid guys in the UFC as well Daniel Argetta, I do think he's going to be at a striking disadvantage here in this matchup. I think Johns will be the better striker, not by a ton, um, but I do like the striking of Johns more. And then I like the offensive wrestling of Argetta more, but I'm not sure if Argetta is going to be able to have success in terms of taking down and holding down Miles Johns, at least early. Uh, as the fight goes on, I could see Dan Argetta you know, starting to go out there you know, having more success with the wrestling because Miles Johns does slow down. You know, Miles Johns does not have great cardio, but... 
I feel like Miles Johns can win at least two of these three rounds, but it's going to be close. It's going to be a close fight. It's going to go to decision, in my opinion, and it all is going to come down to those crooked, corrupt judges. They're probably going to throw a random 10-8 in there, and everybody's going to be really upset about the decision. So I think it goes the distance. I think it's close. I'd rather be on the plus money of Miles Johns, uh, but this one can go either way, in my opinion. I think the opener out of pick em makes a lot more sense to me rather than this this minus 170 on Dan Orgetta. So give me Miles Johns for a decision, but it's going to be a close fight nonetheless, I think. Moving on, we got Charles Jordan going against Ricardo Ramos. Got Charles Jordan, 27 years old, 5'9", with a 69-inch reach, 14, 6, and 1, and 2 and 3 in his last five fights. Ricardo Ramos, 28 years old, 5'9", with a 72-inch reach, 16 and 4, and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. Closely lined fight. Uh, Charles Jordan opened up plus 145, currently minus 135. Ricardo Ramos opened up minus 165, currently plus 115. And yeah, it's a close fight, like I mentioned. I feel like both guys have paths here. And, you know, although Ramos can strike for sure, I kind of see this as a striker versus grappler matchup, whereas Ramos, he does have that black belt. Both guys are black belts, but Ramos, you know, should have the grappling advantage here. And Charles Jordan's takedown defense leaves a lot to be desired. Um, Charles Jordan's takedown defense on paper is sitting at 48% which is not good. That means, you know, every time somebody takes him down or tries to take him down, there's about a 50% chance he is going down. His takedown defense is horrible. A gust of wind it typically takes down Charles Jordan. With that said, like I said, he has a black belt and he has a really good get up game as well. So guys aren't really able to take him down and control him. I know Burgos did a little bit, but typically when he's getting taken down, he's, he's usually popping right back up. So I kind of feel like that's going to be the game plan for Ramos, or at least that should be the game plan of Ricardo Ramos, you know, going out there, mixing in the takedowns, and I think he may have some success, but for, for a lot of, for a big portion of this fight, I do see these guys, you know, standing and banging. I do see these guys going to war, because that's what they like to do. They like to go out there, they like to put on fun and exciting fights, they like to stand and bang, and they're both really good strikers, they're both really dangerous, but the one edge I, I give Charles Jordan, and I think it's a very important edge in this entire fight, because I think this fight's going to be a banger. I think there's a reason why this is the the very first fight on this main card. Um, this is going to be an all-out war, in my opinion, and I trust the durability of Charles Jordan a lot more than I do with Ricardo Ramos. I think Jordan is more dangerous. Jordan, 86% finish rate to uh, Ramos' 69% finish rate, but it's the durability. You know, durability is all in favor of Charles Jordan. 21 fights for Charles Jordan, only one finished loss that came to Juliana Rosa in the third round. Charles Jordan, 21 fights, never been knocked out, whereas I can't say the same thing for Ricardo Ramos. Ricardo Ramos has been finished in three of his four losses, two by knockout, one by submission, and Charles Jordan can crack. He can hit hard, and I'm not sure Ramos has the durability to take some of these shots, especially as the fight goes on in the second or third round, the third round where we see Charles Jordan being his best. I mean, third round Charles Jordan is, is no joke. Just ask uh, Miss Marcella Rojo, ask Andre Yule. I mean, he, put, he beat the absolute breaks off of both those guys in the third round. So, yeah, I think Ramos could potentially have some success here early, especially with the wrestling. But as this fight goes on, I do favor Charles Jordan, and I think he can get Ramos out of there down the stretch. So I'm going to take Charles Jordan to win this fight by third-round knockout, and I think this is probably going to be um, the most exciting fight on the card here. Moving on, we have Brian Battle going against A.J. Fletcher. We got Brian Battle, 29 years old, uh, six foot one with a 77-inch reach, 9-2 and two and 4-1. and one. In his last five fights, A.J. Fletcher, 26 years old, five foot ten with a 67-inch reach, 10-2. and two. And three and two in his last five fights. We take a look at the odds here. Uh, the odds haven't really moved much throughout the week. Brian Battle opened at minus 160, currently minus 185. AJ Fletcher opened at plus 140, currently plus 160. And this would be such an easy, easy AJ Fletcher pick here if he had three round cardio, because this is what Brian Battle struggles with. Brian Battle struggles with, you know, getting taken down, getting controlled, not only in the Renat Fock Radina fight where he got controlled for literally 14 out of the 15 minutes, but even in other fights, he's getting taken down with like little to no resistance. His takedown defense is atrocious. Brian Battle's takedown defense on paper is 38%. So yeah, in theory, AJ Fletcher should go out there take down Brian Battle, and, and and it's going to be easy. It's going to be so easy to take down Brian Battle 
The problem with A.J. Fletcher is the conditioning, the cardio. At about seven and a half minutes, he slows down tremendously. He slows down. Um, he, he gets really tired. It's not a great look, and he's making mistakes in there. You know, the, the Matthew Simmelsberger fight in the third round, you know, losing minutes in the grappling exchanges to, to Matthew Simmelsberger wasn't the best look. In the Angelusa fight, Angelusa put an absolute beating on him in that third round, um, was able to control him a lot in that third round. AJ Fletcher did not have anything left in that third round of both fights. The Lusa fight, the Simmelsberger fight. Anytime this guy gets extended, he slows down, and slowing down against Brian Battle is not a good thing. I mean, Brian Battle is very dangerous. On the feet, he has a ton of power, and he has a slick submission game as well. You know, he submitted Andre Petrovsky in the second round in the tough house. You know, Petrovsky got tired and made a mistake in the grappling, and Brian Battle snatched up his neck. I could see that happening here against A.J. Fletcher. Uh, he was able to submit Gilbert Urbina as well. He was able to knock out Takashi Sato, knock out Gabe Green. Brian Battle is dangerous. It's just his, his takedown defense is horrible. But like I said, you know, can Fletcher wrestle for 15 minutes? I, I lean towards no. I think this is a good live betting spot. Like, I see Battle probably losing the, the first round um, if AJ Fletcher does come in here with the right game plan. But as the fight goes on, you know, Battle is going to have a 10 inch reach advantage. AJ Fletcher blocks punches with his face, 47% striking defense for Fletcher. And like I said, I think the cardio is a big, big advantage for Brian Battle when the cardio is going to take him home here. So give me Brian Battle to win this fight. I'll say second round submission for Brian Battle on this one. Moving on, we have the rematch that absolutely nobody asked for. And if you asked for this rematch, something's wrong with you probably. But we're going to go with uh, Marina Rodriguez taking on Michelle Watterson. We got Marina Rodriguez, 36 years old, 5'6 with a 65-inch reach. 16-3-2 and two, and 3-2 and two in her last five fights. Michelle Watterson Gomez, 37 years old, 5'3 with a 62-inch reach. 18-11 and 11, and 1-4 and four in her last five fights. So... We take a look at the odds. We see that Marina Rodriguez, big favorite, opened up minus 310, currently minus 300. We see that Michelle Watterson opened up plus 260, currently plus 250. And, yeah, this is a rematch, like I said, that nobody asked for, but we're, we're watching anyway. And this is a fight that happened not not too long ago. Uh, this fight happened back in, was it 20, 2020 or 2021? Yeah, 2021. And believe it or not, because I actually forgot about this, and I'm like 99% sure I watched this fight, and I'm 100% sure I did a breakdown for the card, but this was actually a five-round main event, <laughs> believe it or not, but it was, and um, yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm 99% sure I watched it, but I kind of forgot about it, I had to refresh my memory, had to go back and watch the fight, and I, just see, I don't see how this fight plays out any differently, um, I don't see... You know, I don't think either fighter has made any changes at this point of their careers. I think, if anything, Rodriguez probably has improved her, her trash takedown defense a little bit. But, um, yeah, I, just, I don't see this fight going any differently. You know, what's what's going to happen is this fight's going to take place in the striking realm. And, and on the feet, Rodriguez is the better striker. And most importantly, Rodriguez has power. Michelle Watterson Gomez, the reason I think she's losing... A lot of these fights, especially the last one with Luana Panero, because I, I had a bet on uh, Watterson, unfortunately, and Watterson went out there and she outlanded Luana Panero in uh, the first round, 20 to 15, the third round, 22 to 10, and then it was all tied up in the second round. So the judges gave Panero that win, and although I, I disagreed, I see why they did it. The reason they gave Panero the win is because Panero has power. And Michelle Watterson Gomez has zero power whatsoever. No pop on her shots whatsoever. So she's a good minute winner per se, but all the power is going to be coming from Marina Rodriguez. All the, the big shots are going to be coming from Marina Rodriguez. It's one of those fights where I don't think it's the case, but even if Michelle Watterson Gomez were to outland Rodriguez in terms of the numbers, um, it's going to be Rodriguez that is going to be doing all the damage in this matchup. Watterson Gomez does zero damage. So uh, I think it would be smart for Michelle Watterson Gomez to go out there and, and get takedowns. Um, can I count on her to do that? Not entirely. I think it plays on the feet for probably 15 minutes, and uh, Rodriguez should get the win. And um, I'm not really sure why this fight's uh, even happening, but it is. I, you know what you know what I think it is though I think they're trying to get Marina Rodriguez back on track because she's been on a little bit of a skid as of late you know losing to Verna Janda Robo which was a pretty bad matchup for her losing to Amanda Lamosh um, and uh, I think they're gonna try to get 
Rena Rodriguez back on track. But I'm not high on either fighter. Michelle Waterson Gomez, she's on a three fight skid. She's actually lost five of her last six. So if if Waterson Gomez does lose this, I mean she probably is getting cut. Um, so yeah, this might be the last time we see Michelle Waterson Gomez, which is fine. But yeah, give me a give me Rodriguez here to win this fight and win by decision. I, I talked way too long about this matchup and I sincerely apologize. All right, we'll move on to the next fight, co main event. Really good fight here. We got Bryce Mitchell going against Dan Ige. We got Bryce Mitchell, 28 years old, 5'10", with a 70-inch reach, 15-1, and one, and 4-1 and one in his last five fights. Dan Ige, 32 years old, 5'7", with a 71-inch reach, 17-6, and 2-3 and and in his last five fights. So we'll take a look at the odds here. And uh, to my surprise, we got Bryce Mitchell open at minus 270, currently minus 205. Dan Ige open up plus 230 and he's currently plus 175 so this fight is very very intriguing um very intriguing so I, I broke down this fight on pub sports radio on stat diggers with uncle wheezy on sunday and i talked about how you know i i like bryce mitchell in this match not this line but i think it's a, a good matchup for him right and somebody said, how could you like Dan Ige against Damon Jackson? Which I did. I was all over Dan Ige against Damon Jackson. That was my favorite play of the year and one of my favorites. And, and not be on Dan Ige against Bryce Mitchell. It's the same matchup. And I, I, start, I literally laughed out loud because Damon Jackson is um, kind of the same style. But Damon Jackson's older, a lot older, and has no durability. Whereas Mitchell, he's younger, he's making improvements, and he has very, very good durability. But the more I looked into to this fight, the more I think it could get very interesting here. So it's easy to to look at this fight and say, you know, Danny Ige struggles against wrestlers, which, yeah, he, he does. But look at who he's struggling against. Mozvar Evloev, uh, the Korean Zombie, and Mursad Bektich. You know, those were the, the three fights where, you know, guys were able to go out there and, and take him down. Um, other than that, you know, Dan Ige's looked, looked very good in the UFC. Um, of course there was the Cater fight and the Emmett fight, but obviously, you know, Bryce Mitchell does not have the striking of either of those guys. And then I go back and watch the, the Evloev fight, the Bektich fight and the Korean zombie fight. And something I noticed was Evloev wasn't having as much of success as I remembered in the grappling department. Evloev was able to take down Ige nine times. But Evloev wasn't able to really control Ige. Evloev was only able to control Ige in that fight for 6 minutes and 47 seconds, which was, you know, less than half of the fight. And on the feet, Evloev had really solid striking, and Evloev did outland Dan Ige at distance, 51-38. to 38. But it was a, a good sign to see that Ige was not really getting as controlled as much as I remembered. And then I went back to the Korean zombie fight. The Korean zombie was able to control Dan Ige in a 25-minute fight, for only 10 minutes. That means 15 minutes of that fight was on the feet. And at distance, the Korean Zombie was able to outstrike Dan Ige 79 to 69. And then I went back to watch the, the Bektic fight. And in the Bektic fight, Masai Bektic, very good wrestler, was only able to control Dan Ige for 6 minutes and 33 seconds, which that meant on the feet, it was it was on the feet for over half of the fight. And at distance, Dan Ige did outland Bektic 28 to 14. It was ultimately able to beat Mursad Bektic in that fight. So what it comes down to for me, in my opinion, is Bryce Mitchell to win this fight. He's going to have to control Dan Ige for a very long time. I'm talking 10 plus minutes in a 15 minute fight, because if he doesn't do that, there is a massive gap in terms of the striking here. Dan Ige is the much better striker. It's not even close. And, and Bryce Mitchell has been making improvements with the striking. He has. He's looked He's looked better. But Dan Ige is the much better striker by a mile. So Bryce Mitchell is going to have to go out there and control this fight for, in my opinion, at least you know, 8, 9, 10 minutes even because at range, at distance, Dan Ige is going to be doing the much better work. He's going to be landing the much bigger shots. He might even knock out Bryce Mitchell. He might even knock him down. He might even hurt him. Um, you know, Dan Ige is no joke on the feet. And Bryce Mitchell's been looking good as of late outside of the Taporia fight. But, you know, outside of that, he's going out there. He's beating Bobby Moffitt, Matt Sales, Charles Rosa. Like, these are phenomenal matchups for him. Andre Feely, and his best win is, is Edson Barbosa. But Dan Ige is going out there, you know, fighting Evloev, Josh Emmett, Korean Zombie, you know, Calvin Cater, you know, the best of the best um, in the division. So 
I think Danny is really live in this matchup. You know, you know, first glance, I thought probably a good matchup for Bryce Mitchell, but I don't know. Um, I feel like if Dan Ige is able to keep the standing for at least half of the fight, he'll be able to win minutes and potentially moments in this matchup. So I'm going to take Dan Ige to win this fight. I'll actually say he wins it by decision. I think it's going to be one of those fights where it's like damage versus control. Uh, Bryce Mitchell's able to get a takedown, control Dan Ige, and on the feet, Dan Ige is busting up Bryce Mitchell for a couple minutes. So I think it's going to be like a damage control type potential split decision. And again, going to the judges, which is frightening because the judges are, are blind and, and corrupt. Uh, but I will take Dan Ige to win this fight by decision. All right, time for the main event. I did do a main event deep dive um, posted that the other day. So if you want to you know check that out for a more in-depth breakdown, check it out on my channel. But yeah, we got Rafael Fiziev going against Mateus Gamrot. We got Fiziev, 30 years old, 5'8", with a 71 and a half inch reach. 22 in, or 12 and 2 in 4 and 1 in his last five fights. Mateus Gamrot, 32 years old, 5 foot 10 with a 70 and a half inch reach, 22 and 2 in 4 and 1 in his last five fights. We shall take a look at the odds, and they have not moved since I did my, my main event breakdown. Um, so Fizzy have opened up minus 175, currently minus 150. Gamrot opened up plus 150, currently plus 130. And yeah, I mean, you know, from a. If this fight was three rounds, I would be max betting Rafael Fiziev. I really would. I think it's a great matchup for him for the first three rounds. Uh, the, the fourth and fifth round, it gets a little tricky because there have been multiple fights where Fiziev has slowed down in the past. And I'm not talking, you know, slowing down in the fourth and the fifth. I'm talking about slowing down in the third, losing third rounds, you know, having competitive third rounds with guys like Mark Diacasey, Alex White. Uh, losing third rounds to Bobby Green. I mean, this guy, Fiziev, slows down in a lot of third rounds. I will say, though, as of late, his cardio's looked a lot better, um, a lot, lot better, and we did see him go into the fourth and fifth round against RDA, which is was a positive sign, and he looked fine doing so. Of course, this is a, a different uh, matchup than, than RDA, kind of the same matchup, but different because Gamrot is a lot more in his prime. I think Gamrot's the better wrestler than RDA by sure, for sure. So yeah, a little bit different a matchup, but, but kind of the same stylistic matchup there. Uh, but Gamrot is a guy that can wrestle, he will wrestle, and I think Gamrot to win this fight is going to have to attempt upwards of honestly 20 to 25 takedown attempts in this matchup. Because on the feet, although I think Gamrot's a solid striker, Fiziev is a phenomenal striker, one of the best strikers in the division, and he's like getting better. Like Fiziev, he's, he's only 30 years old. Each time we see Fiziev in there, his striking just looks better. This guy throws with a ton of power. I'm shocked that Fiziev doesn't have more knockouts on his record with how hard this guy strikes. I mean, this guy puts everything into his strikes. He hits very, very hard. And that's a concern here for me. You know, on the feet, I, I favor Fiziev pretty heavily. Gamrot's been dropped in his last three matchups. Um, but Neil Dariush, um was able to drop him. We saw that uh, Armin Sarukian was able to drop him, which is, which is not good. And then uh, Jalen Turner was able to, to drop him. So I have a feeling, like a strong feeling that Fiziev drops Gamrod here. You know, does he knock him out? I don't know, because Gamrod has really good recover recoverability. In 24 fights, Gamrod's never been knocked out. But I don't know. Maybe Fiziev is able to get him out of there. But my concern is, you know, what does Fiziev look like in the fourth and fifth round here? I feel like he's going to be able to easily stuff the takedowns in the first round, two rounds, maybe three rounds. But as the fight goes on, you know, is Fiziev's cardio going to hold up? If he does, I think it's a good matchup, but you know, I, I do think he slows down a little bit in this matchup. I think Gamrot might have some success down the stretch, but I think at that point, it might be a little bit too late at that point. I feel like Fizia probably, probably already knocked down Gamrot a time or two. I feel like Fizia probably already banked the, the first three rounds, so I'm going to take Fizia to win this fight by decision, but I think it could be a little bit closer than, than some people think. Um, but I, I like Fizia here. I'd love him in a three-round fight. I mean, I would love him. But the five-round aspect of things worries me a little bit because Fiziev, we've seen him slow down so many times. And Gamrot, you know, it's, it, he never slows down, ever. So I'm going to take Fiziev to win this fight. Fiziev by decision. I think he gets a knockdown, but I'm not sure he gets him out of there. So Fiziev for, uh, by decision for me. And those are the picks. 11 fights there. Thank you all so much for watching. If you guys could leave a like on your way out, subscribe to the channel. And, yeah, week off. One week off, which is going to be good. Um, good, good mental week. Take the week off. I'm not taking the week off from contender series. So technically I don't have a week off, but, uh, we'll be back in two weeks. We have UFC Vegas 80. I think it's Bobby green versus 
Grant Dawson, believe it or not, in a five-round main event. But we have some great cards coming up. 295 is going to be incredible. Even 294 I'm liking, but 295 is incredible. John Jones, Stephen Miocic, 296 to end the year is going to be awesome. We have some really fun fight cards to look forward to. So looking forward to ending the year strong. It's been a great 2023. And, uh, yeah, hoping to keep up the success here, guys. So best of luck, everybody. UFC Vegas 79. And we'll talk to you guys very soon. See you later.